kick off the conference, we will start our first plenary talk. I am delighted to introduce Julia Moore, who is going to deliver the first plenary talk today. Julia is going to talk about NHS in 2020 and beyond. Before I hand over to Julia, I would like to say a couple of words about her background and her achievement in career. I was reading her bio last night. I was excited to mention several things. I hope that I will not miss very important issues, but I will give you a highlight about her. Julia has had a long career in the NHS. She was the chief executive of Warwick, sorry, chief executive of University Hospitals Birmingham for the last 12 years of her career in the NHS. After retiring from the full-time work in NHS in 2018, she became a professor of healthcare systems at Warwick Manufacturing Group at University of Warwick. She has honorary doctorates from the University of Birmingham, Birmingham State University, Oxford Brookes University, and also from Aston University. She has also acted as a non-executive director at Worcester Acute Hospitals, a non-executive advisor to Our Health Partnership, and a non-executive director of Research Health. Recently, she has been a member of the organizing committee for the 2020 Commonwealth Games. Julia has also contributed to many national projects, including to lead the education reforms as part of government's future form. Moreover, she is a founder member and also the past chair of the Shelford groups that involves 10 leading academic hospitals in England. Today, She's going to talk about NHS in 2020 and beyond. I am looking forward to listening what she is going to say about the future of our healthcare systems in the UK. Julia, the floor is yours. Well, thank you for that very kind introduction. When I first had the email asking me to come and talk at OR64, for me, OR is operating rooms. And I sort of said, someone said that, people would find that funny. But for me, it was, I'm not an operating department practitioner. I'm not sure what I can talk about in that. But then it was explained to me what it was. So then I explained I'm not a researcher either. And then I got told, well, actually, the NHS is a big complex system and a lot of us work in there. And actually, it probably could do with a bit more OR. So um, to talk about the current problems of the NHS... Now, I'm going to take you through, obviously, some factual stuff, but some of it is going to be my opinions when I, when I get onto this. Um, and I'll draw from that. But this is a very organised conference, and they asked me to have my slides in a week ago. Now, I'm not really used to that. I do last-minute alterations. But I thought, well, what can happen in a week? Now, <laughs> new Prime Minister, new Secretary of State, all the old ones out, new Treasury people. So I'm going to have to just talk about what I think might happen with some of those. I tried to cover it by looking at what the... Um, Tory party candidates were saying about the NHS, um, and that wasn't very enlightening anyway. So one other thing I would just mention is Nalan was kind enough to mention the um, 2022 Commonwealth Games, and I will just say that Warwick was used as one of the villages for the athletes, and the feedback from the athletes was it was fantastic. They were so well looked after, so I'm, I was very proud, but my thanks go to anybody who was involved in that because it was a brilliant time for them. So... You cannot fail to look at the current state of the NHS by the headlines. Um, we've seen some recent horrific stories of, of patients' families building little tents over people lying in the street because the ambulance was going to take hours to get there. The size of the waiting list is growing. People are complaining about not being able to get GP appointments. One of the Conservative Party candidates reckons she couldn't get an NHS dental appointment. Um, a lot in the press about that because she probably could have afforded to not have to go via the NHS, but never mind. And we've had the pandemic. But are all these problems been caused by the pandemic? I don't think so, and we'll go through that. So I'm going to take us back to 25 years and then look forward. 
So first of all, the headlines. Now this graph um, takes us to the earlier part of the year, but you can see how waiting times for ambulances have gone up. You know, we had the target set of, um, it was actually in minutes, in single figures of mi minutes, depending on the category of call. You've now got ambulances saying sometimes, well, um, take your relative to hospital because you'll get them quicker than we'll get to you. And it's for heart attacks and things like that that's been in the press. The waiting list hit six million. It is quite interesting that people may well say it's the pandemic caused it, but the bulk of the waiting list started before the pandemic. It was already at four million. So there was clearly a growing problem with the NHS before the pandemic hit. So I think we had a stress system hit by a much bigger stressor. GPs, complaints about GPs, can't see patients face-to-face, -face, won't see patients face-to-face. -face. And equally, there's been a little bit in some of the press about GPs are lazy, they all want to work part-time, they all want to go home early and they're not seeing patients. We'll look at the truth of that later. But it is true that the average wait to get a GP appointment now is over two weeks for a routine appointment. And the NHS recognises that dental services are failing and they're trying to get more appointments out to try and deal with that. And satisfaction's falling. Now, this is a very interesting graph. If you look here, this is, this, this is satisfaction, this is dissatisfaction, and there's the grey people who clearly don't give a, a, a view either which way throughout the whole thing. They probably don't use it. So satisfaction rose, satisfaction fell, and then there's been a very steep change here. So we're going to look at some reasons why that might be. I've put that little red arrow in there, and these little arrows, because these are showing change of governments. This, the red government, is when the Blair government came into power, and then the Labour government. This is when there was the Conservative Liberal Coalition. Mix the blue and the, green, blue and the yellow there to make green. This is where Cameron won his own majority. This is when May took over, this is when Johnson took over, and this is when the pandemic hit. So actually, you can start to see that there's something very real happened around this, so we're going to explore that a little bit. So what is the state of the NHS? Why are the public so dissatisfied? Well, there are organisations that do international comparisons. Commonwealth Fund, it's not the Commonwealth. I don't know why it's called the Commonwealth, but then I realised I don't actually know what the word Commonwealth means. But this one is a series of 11 developed nations who come together to compare information and data on their services. And they've delivered three health reports now, the first one in 2014 and the latest in 2021. So they say, what makes a high-performing healthcare system? Universal coverage, so people aren't worried about having to pay for it. That primary care is a feature of the system, so people can get high value services, they get signposted to the right services, no discrimination or unequal treatment. And that patients haven't got to do all the work themselves, they've not got to do the admin of finding the right clinician. They come up with that. And also, social services are really important. When people no longer need healthcare, but they need some other kind of support, they have social services, and that there's a whole pile of other factors which I think are really important, nutrition, education, childcare, housing, safety, all contribute to health. Now this was the first one they did in 2014. And as you can see, the UK, nicely put the arrow there, came first. And it came first in every domain except healthy lives. And that healthy lives related more to public health issues what we're doing to keep people healthy, and the other factors that go towards health. But the NHS itself was viewed as number one in the whole um, Commonwealth ranking. If you look at the cost of the healthcare, the cheapest is New Zealand at 3,182 per person, second cheapest NHS at 3,000. Of note is America, which came last and cost a lot more, two and a half times more than the British system. Yet if you go to America and listen to their talk about the NHS, they'll talk about socialised medicine and killing lists and all kinds of things, and yet the outcomes are not better, yet their spend is a phenomenal amount more at 8,000. So then they followed it up in 2017, and again, the, the results are remarkably similar. The UK is number one. Healthcare outcomes again, which depend on a whole range of other factors rather than the NHS, we're pretty, well, we're next to bottom up, but 
but we still come first overall. Then we repeated it in 2021. And you can see here that the UK has fallen down the table in every domain. That actually it's been overtaken by Norway, Netherlands, and by Australia. So what's happened and why did that happen in 2021? Before we get to that though, even on that rating, the UK was in the top half of that table. So it's delivered high quality healthcare consistently and it doesn't spend more to achieve it. So let's have a look at the healthcare um, spending as a proportion of GDP. Now there's two things going on, there's a lot going on in this slide, it's very, very busy. So the UK is this slide here. Now for some reason these people have chosen an awful lot of very similar colours, but it goes along here and it ends up around here, because fortunately, I'll show that in a minute. And again, the UK is up here, but to make it really easy, I pulled it out there to show that this is life expectancy versus expenditure. So what this is showing is that as the amount of money increases along this bottom axis, this is life expectancy going up the y-axis. And as you can see, the UK did really, really well till here. And that's marked on there, 2011, it plateaued, and then it's just starting to fall again now. Whereas if you go back, other countries have continued to improve. So if the likes of Japan and Italy and all these appear are continuing to improve life expectancy for not an awful lot of expenditure. But actually, the UK has levelled off and has started to fall. In terms of where the UK is here in this um, healthcare spending versus performance, the UK is smack in the middle. So even after everything I've said, it's still a relatively good performer. So let's look at the number of other resources it has. It has fewer beds than any others. Now, all healthcare systems have been reducing beds and finding different ways as day case surgery came in, as people attend as walking patients and all the rest of it for surgery. Um, bed numbers have been cut, but the UK has cut far harsher than any other nation. It started off on a low baseline. It's got fewer beds. And then if you take that against the EEC and the other um, G7 countries, it's really, really low. Only Denmark, Ireland and Sweden are lower. Numbers of doctors. Now, they don't always count this across the whole, um, the numbers of countries all the time. So this, this is going back to 2014. UK is lower. But since then, we've had several things that have made doctors leave the profession. We haven't trained as many. We've lost some doctors to the system. So a recent one that came out showing the numbers of doctors last year, say with the lowest of the OECD, the numbers of doctors per thousand, patient, per thousand of population. We're pretty low on nurses as well. Scanners, high technology. We're quite near the bottom of that table. Only Romania and Hungary have fewer MRIs and only Hungary has fewer CT scanners. And our spend, we'll cover this in many other different ways, but actually it's pretty near the middle of the pack. So with fewer resources, an average to low spend, we're delivering pretty good results. So why, why are we getting all of this? So, the deterioration in the Commonwealth Fund was due to delays in treatment. As the waiting list started to grow, it slipped down the um, table. Lack of investment in the service, not enough technology coming through, the buildings falling into disrepair. And then actually, our, the state of our old buildings really showed up in COVID because when people were trying to distance patients, when you still have patients being treated in big old Nightingale wards or multi-space areas, that capacity had to be taken out. The relative poverty that has grown in this country, despite that the NHS is good, needs to change, but let's just talk about what kind of change. So let's go back to when it was performing. So we had this graph before. Here's the UK. In 1997, so this has been going back to 25 years, Funding for the NHS was an election issue. The, Blair, the pr prospective Blair government said there was 24 hours to save the NHS. It was a big political issue. And on the 16th of January 2000, Tony Blair went on the Frost Show and had what was called the most expensive breakfast in history. He was challenged to why is our healthcare expenditure so low and said, will you 
take our spending to get it more in line with the um, European average. And he said he would do that by 2005. That was, at the time, a bit of a surprise and a shock to, the, um, to his Treasury people. But indeed, that's what happened. So when you follow this line through, that's, that's when he had the, um, they were elected, the breakfast, and the, they brought out then the NHS plan. And that's where the um, UK ended up on the graph. It did come out to be in the middle of the pack. And then if you look at the annual UK spending as a percentage of national income, so real spending is the solid line and the percentage of GDP is the right axis, that's when the promise kicked in. That was the first trend line and the second trend line. So they really did deliver on increasing the funding. So what was the impact? So the green line shows where the, the, the government changed and the money started to be put in 2000, 2001. And OK, there was a bit of a plateau because actually it takes time to invest in getting staff and facilities in. But then there started to be a fall in the waiting list, wait, waiting times of patients waiting for inpatients. This one is outpatients. And actually, that's a really important thing because we didn't used to measure waiting time for outpatients before then. There were a load of quality measures that were introduced that had never been introduced before. So we started to see real improvements as investment in health kicked in. The size of the waiting list, likewise, changed. So at its peak, when the government was elected there, the money started being invested here. There's a plateau while systems get going, and then it starts to fall. And it comes down to 2009. And 2009 is a pretty key point, which I'll come to. But other things happened. We'd never had measurements of infection control. There were people wandering around, like infection control managers, infection control nurses, saying MRSA is a real problem, we've got to address it. But there was no incentive in terms of pressure for people to do so. It wasn't being measured. Good people did try and address it. But we started measuring MRSA rates. We started measuring other organisms. The government introduced an inspection regime with the precursor of the CQC. Back then, it was called something different. But we started having people go around and inspecting actually what was going on. And we started looking um, systematically at patient feedback, what they were saying about the services. And we asked their friends and family, you know, what do you think about the service? And we asked the staff, would you like to be treated here? You know, a whole pile of questions. All of that was new. Other things came in, like we had to do nutrition assessment, falls assessments. There were 13 um, measures of, of nursing care that came in at that point. And then the government, shock horror, introduced league tables. Started off with the star system, so you could be one, two, or three star, and then it did, did go on to league tables. So we were actually doing comparative performance, which was a real shock to the system, but it really did have the impact of making people focus on quality as well as quantity of healthcare. It did lead to some bad behavior. You know, um, there was a dreadful tale about how people were defining a bed. What was a bed? Because you were saying a patient was in a bed and whether did it have wheels, did it not have wheels? Could it, it was a nonsense. So then that, the Department of Health had to issue a definition of a bed, which went on for eight pages. And so there was some bad behavior, but on the whole, it did have a positive effect. So we saw improvements in both the size of the waiting list, waiting times, and waiting times did actually, the target to get everybody down for waiting times were pretty strict. So things like um, waiting time for referral to treatment, so-called RTT, 18 weeks. So from your first referral to being treated had to be done in 18 weeks. Um, for cancer, it was a lot shorter, two week wait to get your first appointment and diagnostic things for cancer. Ambulances, category ones were eight minutes, you know, really tight ones to do. And the quality measures came in and they were objective. And then there were some more subjective ones measuring staff and patient feedback. So when did they stop? So I've mentioned this, the RTT, referral to treatment time. Now I lost a little thing up at the top. And that said it should be at 18 weeks. So the blue bars should always hit the black line. So the black line's the standard, the blue lines are the numbers of patients. And as you can see, it started to diverge around, um, well, 15. But then it really, really fell off as we got towards COVID, but not actually caused by COVID. Where's my little spot gone? So here, it's diverging pretty much, and then COVID, it just falls off a cliff. 
But that's the last time the standard was met when it started to diverge. And believe me, as a chief executive, you focused on every single last patient. You, you weren't thinking about big numbers, you were talking about ones and twos, because you really did get hauled over the coals if you had a patient waiting more than 18 weeks. So then, breaking this apart a bit further, how many were waiting 18 weeks? So it got to 2010 and they fell off and then there was a massive push, massive push to get patients treated and people managed to do it for a while and then a decline that's continued to this day. So the, the, it, it did manage to hit it for that period in there but other things happened as well which we'll come to. So this is A&E. A&E was a, a really difficult one because it's demand is sort of unpredictable, sort of not unpredictable, but it depends on a lot of other factors as well. So the four-hour standard, which had been hit, which was 98% to be treated within four hours, was being hit and being hit well. They dropped the standard, which is always um, a bad sign, and then it's had this absolutely dreadful decline. And now, um, I don't know um, what the current figures are, but they're much lower than that 86%. And a worrying one for a lot of people is cancer. And this was the two-week wait, the operational standard. So this is then the overall treatment. The two-week wait is for diagnostics. The 62 days is for treatment, and that's for people treated outside 62 days. So it was a small number, and it's grown and grown and grown. The operational standard is here, 85% should be treated and people are not being treated in that time. That's more or less up to now as much as these figures go. But the decline had started and we last hit it about there. So, remembering when all that happened, and I'll pull it together later, let's look at the changes in funding that happened. So this is the rolling 10-year average of the change in spending in terms of percent. So here increase was up to 6%, get down to 7%, massive increase with that Labour government here, and then it's just fallen off. And that is when the so-called austerity started. And I'm sure you remember austerity, also you might not remember austerity. Um, this is as a percentage of GDP. So early years of the NHS here, it increased by about 3% a year, 3.5% fell a couple of times there, this rise under the Blair and Brown government, and then it started to fall off again. 2010-11, a keynote there. So uh, austerity, so UK have been operating a budget surplus. The finances started getting a bit worse. Then in 2008-9, we had the financial crash. And the first austerity measures were introduced in late 2008. The Conservative Lib Dem coalition came in in 2010 and I remember them saying we will have austerity for two years, we will restore the budget deficit, we'll get back on track and then we'll be good to go, we'll be fine. But austerity lasted over 10 years. And on that time the NHS budget grew by only 1.4%. Now you might think a budget growing is okay and a lot of other public sector will say, well, you're not being cut, you're fine in NHS, but demand was growing 3, 4, 5, 6, 7% in some cases. We, the demography of the UK is we have an ageing population, we have a big burden of chronic disease, um, and so the demand on the NHS was growing much faster than that. So the previous target was that. So again, the King's Fund broke it down by government, so you can see what the average... Um, rises were by Prime Minister. They broke it down, not just by government, but by, by the Prime Minister involved. There, 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 Blair Brown, and we'll come on to the others in a bit. So this is a more recent graph, which shown that in the early years of the NHS, increases around about 4%. Conservative government dropped it a bit. Labour government really upped it. And then the, the, the coalition, actually the ones who dropped it lowest. Then we had the um, Cameron government. And since then, it's dropped even more. So this is when austerity started, or the financial crash started, sorry. There's very little increase in it all here. Until we get to here, there's been an increase when Theresa May gave a three-year settlement. These bits are the COVID funding. So they're not the bits that went direct to the NHS. You will have all heard about track and trace and PPE and all the rest of it and things that went in to help deal with COVID. They did not go direct to the NHS, it's core budget. 
So I'm going to argue there's a very clear demonstrable link between funding and healthcare. When the funding changed, performance started to change. It didn't instantly drop, but it took a bit of time. It started to deteriorate and deteriorate, <coughs> both in quantity and quality. But the cost of healthcare in the UK is always a political issue. Who can forget the bus? I never will. Um, and then you start to get the press saying that actually healthcare's a burden. That um, fairly recently, some of the um, tabloids have been saying the NHS is bloated and wasteful. But if you look at international comparisons, it's not. I'm not saying it can't do better. It can always do better. And the performance is patchy across the NHS. But as a whole system, it's pretty good. It delivers near the top of the table with fewer resources, fewer people than other systems. And you could argue that healthcare is not a cost on the nation, it's actually an investment in the nation. If you look at alternative systems like the um, American system, the cost to the individuals, apart people wondering whether they can afford healthcare or people who can't afford healthcare, and if you look at the cost of employers, it costs an awful lot more to a society than the NHS does. The NHS was the jewel in this nature. People used to look at it from abroad and think it was brilliant, but we're actually had, um, since, 2008, we've had a lack of investment, and the one that really, really um, sticks for me is workforce, but I'll come to that. Because it's not just about how we all keep healthy, because we're all here and look really reasonably okay today. The cost of poor health, the cost of health inequality is really high. So some researchers in the north of England a long time ago said that inequality costs the NHS a lot of money, just by allowing people to have unequal access and, and, and um, living in deprived areas causes issues. Now, um, a gentleman I know called Michael Marmot did his famous Marmot review in 2010, where he reckoned back in 2010 health inequalities resulted in lost production of 31 billion. I, though people who were off sick just couldn't work and we were losing 31 billion to the economy. So he argued lost benefits, like, you know, paying benefits, losing taxes. But in 20th century England, we continued to get better. But in 2011, as you saw from one of those other graphs, those improvements slowed to a halt. And actually, for the back end of that decade to 2020, life expectancy actually fell in the most deprived communities. This has not happened for decades and decades, but in 2010 to 2020, life expectancy fell. And the time spent in poor health, so not just dying, but actually the amount of years you spend in poor health is increasing. And Marmot says, if health stopped improving, it's a sure sign that society has stopped improving. Evidence around the world shows that health is a good measure of social and economic progress. And he says, you can't necessarily attribute the slowdown in health improvement to austerity because you can't do you can't do a double blind you know you could do half the country in austerity and the other half not you can't do it however everything that he knows that the austerity was then followed by failure of health to improve doesn't prove one cause the other but it's a pretty strong link given what's happened to all the determinants of health now he followed up this report in 2020 10 years later he did a follow up to this and he said, actually, it's got worse. That rising child poverty, the closure of children's centres, declines in educational funding, people on zero hours contract on precarious work. You don't know if you're working tomorrow, but you've got to be on call and you're not paid. The housing crisis we have. When I was young, which is a long, long time ago now, the average house price was around three times the average income. It's now nine times. So young people just haven't got a chance. And then you get commentators coming out and saying, well, they'd be able to afford it if they didn't have avocado toast and fancy coffees. I mean, there's just, it's just nonsense talked by people who really don't know what they're talking about. And the rise in food, bank, food banks in this country, I think, is a matter of shame. That actually we are one of the wealthiest countries, and yet we've got a growth in the use of food banks. And he wrote this before the energy um, price rises were coming. And he said there were ignored com communities who had poor conditions and little reason for hope. And the outcomes, the health outcomes on the whole, are worse for minority ethnic population groups than anybody with disabilities in this. So, what he said, though, is that, you know, which of these trends is affecting healthcare? And he said some, such as increases in child poverty, won't be shown for a long time. 
people. Aster austerity has adversely affected the social determinants that impact on health in the short, medium and long term. In other words, there's going to be a long tail from this period of austerity. Oh, he said that as well. I thought I was being original. So what he's saying there is the question is not can we afford better health, it's how can we afford not to have better health, thinking about the kind of society we want. And is it still only September? In September, he said this, epidemic levels of fuel poverty, which affect half of UK households, will cause a significant humanitarian cost with thousands of lives lost and millions of children's development blighted. Now, it's not just that. A lot of health leaders have now spoken out saying that the fuel poverty is going to lead to um, an increase in poor health and increase in condi bad conditions. When I was first a chief exec a very long time ago now, we did a research study where we actually took um, an area of poor housing and we used the research money to change the windows in those houses to stop them being drafty and cold and damp. And the increase in respiratory health in that group was significant. And the intervention in putting in the windows cost a lot less than treating those people for a lifetime of chronic bronchitis and, and other lung diseases. So what he's saying is the same thing will happen when people cannot keep warm. Again, other people are saying this, that this is the Northern Health Science Alliance in January 2022, that the lost productivity is costing the nation as well as what it's costing the individuals. And that actually, if you just want to make a pure economic argument, it makes sense to invest in the health of the nation. So where are we now? The national picture, we've got COVID, we've had Brexit, we've had climate change. There's increases in technology coming in, and, and one of the things that the NHS still keeps doing is that you've still got to use the modern technology. Now, the finances, the Office of Budget Responsibility said Brexit is going to cost the, the UK 4% of its GDP. We've got inflation running like it's never run before. Our debt is now higher than any time in the past 50 years. Apparently, the current growth rate is around 1.7%, but on the way in this morning, it said that, that we've had zero growth for the past since July in the country. And the Bank of England predict a recession next year. We've committed to spend money to achieve net zero, which is really important that we do because climate change is real. And we've got the highest tax burden since the immediate post-war period. Now, I'm saying that because we now have a new prime minister. At the time, I didn't know who it was going to be but I knew we were going to get one, so I had to put that in, so I didn't know what they were going to say about that. So if you look at all that in the facing the nation and then what's happening with the NHS, demand's going to continue to grow. Now, the pandemic is evolving, but it's not as simple as you get COVID, you get over it, and you don't. All the evidence now is saying that COVID is actually a microvascular disease that causes problems in most organ systems. So it's not like the flu, you get it and you get better. It's causing lasting damage um, to certain people's different systems and it can be any system in your body so people are talking about the effects on the brain the effects on the lungs the effects on the microvascular we don't know enough about it but there is a reasonable assumption that there's going to be a long-term health tale to covid waiting times and waiting list sizes are growing there's a massive push in the nhs now to get the longest waiters treated and seen we have an aging population an increasingly sick population and we've seen the heat wave We've seen floods. We've now seen drought. I'm, I'm really tempted to say in the four horsemen of the apocalypse, but I won't. But anyway, and then we've got new technologies coming along that the NHS is being asked to adopt, new treatments. We've got growing inequalities. So are we likely to see major increases in funding? Because that's what the NHS needs. I doubt we are, so we're going to have to change. So what kind of change do we need to bring in? Now, the NHS has been subject to many reorganisations and internal restructurings, sometimes as many as one every year, I can remember. Health commentators call them re-disorganisations. And some of them have come about as a result of political belief rather than any proper empirical evidence that the change would lead to any improvements. So if you think about, um, there was a right-wing thing that if you introduced market with tendering and people had to tender for services, things would get better. All the evidence is that it didn't. And often when services were tendered out, they failed and had to be brought back into the fold. The involvement of the private sector, there's a lot of heat created about this, but the involvement of the private sector 
has been small, has remained small, and where it's bit come in with a great big fanfare, it's generally fallen flat on its face. So if you think about it, there's an organisation called Circle Group took over a hospital called Hinchinbrook, which had failed. Um, it's somewhere down south. Um, and I went to visit it, and their big thing was they were improving the food, they had a chef, they were doing this, something, the other. Anyway, after, I think it was about a year, they pulled out because they said they just couldn't make the money they were paid for healthcare work. It was too low to, to make them it worth their while, so they pulled out. Mr. Lansley, Lord Lansley, gave commissioning power to GPs. And these things all go on. People, if, you, if, you, if you get the GPs to commission all the services, it'll be better. If you get the private sector, it doesn't. But what does happen over the years is the pendulum swing between the centre needs to tightly control absolutely everything in the kind of NHS Stalinist approach, right down to we're going to set organisations free to deliver the best health care they can and we'll just pay them for what they do, but we will not dictate how it's done. In this July, we've just had the creation of integrated care systems, and I bet you all knew that, and you've all been studying it really carefully. The intention is to integrate all the providers and all the system across the neighbourhood so that everyone will work together, because the big argument that goes on at the moment is that all the pressure's felt in the A&E department, but in the community and GPs, they don't feel the pressure. Actually, everybody feels the pressure. So they've said we're going to integrate, but in typical NHS DH style, They've not integrated the organisations. They've just all basically said, you've got to cooperate better together, but you're all individually to account for your own organisation, which I don't think makes any sense. Then, in January, Sajid Javid was the Secretary of State for Health, and he announced what was really needed was an academy school type of hospital, i.e. free to innovate, free to be in chains, free to um, determine their own destiny. And he said that just as he was putting an act through Parliament to abolish foundation trusts that were set up as academy-style organisations to do just what he said. So you forgive me if at the time I was starting to think that people really didn't know what was going on. Let's abolish foundation trusts, but let's talk about inventing them again as well at the same time. They also react very quickly to a scandal or some kind of press report. And that comes under the need to be doing something this is something, so we'll do it, kind of category. So one of those creations was the Healthcare Safety Investigation Branch. Now, who would argue that we need an investigation branch for healthcare safety? Nobody, except we already had some. So we had the CQC, we had other organisations, so this was just another organisation added to the regulators. When I was chief executive, um, I added up how many organisations had the right to come in and inspect and regulate us. And if anyone want to make a guess, I can tell you now it's in three figures. It was over 200. And some of those had statutory powers to close you. Now, I am including, because I did include everything, things like the fire service and things like that. But there was a phenomenal amount of organisations can dip their fingers in the pie, interfere, and walk away with no consequence. This was another one that was created. Matt Hancock, when he became Secretary of State for Health, created NHSX. Now, that, isn't that a nice, trendy, modern, digital... Um, name. X stands for nothing, really. But this was supposed to be the digital arm. But he created this without really recognising NHS Digital already existed. So we had NHS X and NHS Digital. And have I said to NHS Digital, what's your role? They said, well, our role is to determine strategy for the digitisation of the NHS, blah, 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 blah. I go to NHS and ask them, and they'd say exactly the same. And they'd say, we determine strategy, they implement, and both said it about the other. And they've now been merged but they existed for some time with boards and everything else going on. Now, if you had members of them there, there, they'd all say we had a slightly different view, but actually they didn't. All of this adds expenditure, takes people out of the front line, and it's a big distraction for staff, because when you get these new bodies coming up, they all want to go and do a grand tour and meet everybody and go, you know, they've all got to do that. So it's a real distraction to have all these um, disorganisations going on. Now, the real bugbear I have is the workforce. There's currently around, I, when I wrote this, it was 130,000 vacancies. The latest is 136,000 vacancies. That's about 10% of the um, workforce. We have never, ever, ever invested in sufficient education and training for the NHS. And we used to get around that in the past because we used to import people. We used to have a lot of um, medics coming from Europe because we'd signed and agreed that of equivalence. We used to take a lot from around all over the world, and then we had a kind of 
um, bit of a conscience about saying, well, hang on, um, is it right to these countries train their medics? Should we be nicking them? And we had an accord that we weren't nicking them. We've now gone back to nicking them. The cost of training a medic is around about a quarter of a million. And you think, oh, wow. But actually, if you haven't got a doctor and you need to pay locum costs for a full year for a doctor, it comes to about a quarter of a million. So you'd recoup your costs in a year. However, Treasury have got oversight of the training budget and they think it took a quarter of a million to train one person. Nah. So, when the um, vote happened to leave the EEC, the EU, I had just recruited five consultant doctors from Europe in hard to fill posts and all of them gave back word and said they weren't coming. So we lost those five. That has continued. The numbers of nurses coming from the EEC to work in the NHS, because people will come for five years, young people, I remember being young, getting experience of being abroad, seeing other systems. It fell by 98% the applications to come for nurses to work in this country. Now, Barclay was another health secretary we've had in this time this year that I've been doing this, and he now says on the 5th of this month, that he's going to make it easier to recruit clinical staff from abroad, because also if they are going to come here, they have to do it through phenomenal amounts of hoops to get in. So we've come full circle. If you add to that, that the current NHS staff are burnt out after the pandemic, it's exceptionally difficult to, to work with full personal protective equipment on, to work through the uncertainty of, of the pandemic. And if you... Every time you open the press and read about yourself, you're lazy, you're bloated, you're not doing the right job and all the rest of it, it's really, really difficult. People are demoralised and then they don't get offered anything like a proper pay rise. And I don't know if you've picked up on the latest issue, but some staff in quite senior roles, like nurse specialists, they get a pay rise, but because that takes them over a threshold, their increase in national insurance and pension contributions mean they've got a pay cut and they've got to be, have it backdated to April, so they're having money taken off them for their pay rise, you can understand why people are pretty demoralised right now. The other thing that is worth mentioning is that the government introduced higher pension rules, so it's all to do with your notional amount that you can have in your pension pot. And consultants get near that because they spend a lifetime working in the NHS, they, they contribute to their pension. If you go above that notional cap, you're subject to much higher tax and I think people were being asked to do additional waiting lists and being paid for it and suddenly found and they were presented with a bill from the Treasury for doing it, from the, from the tax people for doing it. And I do personally know one consultant who'd done a lot of extra work, got paid and had to remortgage his house to pay the bill. Now, that is not an exaggeration. The tax bills coming in were huge for people on this. So now you have consultants who will not do additional work and they're the only people we can ask to do some of this waiting list work. Um, they won't do it because it, they end up paying to do it. Equally, there's a lot of people retiring earlier than they need to because if they carry on working and they have to continue in the pension, then they just end up paying a lot of money. Now, the Treasury know about these rules and they are saying, ah, yes, but we can't treat high earners differently. No, but you need these people to actually come and deal with what's going on in the NHS. And it is one thing that Truss has said she's going to address. So there's no incentive to perform extra work. There's no incentive to not retire as soon as you can once you've hit your pension um, maximum. So throughout my career, it's always been easy to think, let's kick the can down the road. A parliament lasts for five years. A treasury spending review lasts generally three years, but it takes 10 years to train a doctor. So let the next parliament deal with it, the next spending review deal with it. Nobody's ever really come up with a proper workforce plan to enable us to train the amount of clinical staff we need. Equally, they're quite rigid programmes. We've not, it's got better, but we've not built in enough flexibility and agility to allow people to chop and change between jobs. And I don't believe the NHS staff are properly rewarded. <sighs> Jeremy Hunt. Um, it's had a sort of a bit of an epiphany here. He says, if you don't train enough doctors, this is the price you pay. Actually, he was in power as Secretary of State for a long time and he didn't do it. And so when challenged on that, he says, it's the biggest regret of my life that I did not put more into training more doctors and more clinical staff. And he's right, it should have been the biggest regret of his life. But how many more are going to say that? I don't know who's the, who's the Secretary of State this week. Oh, Theresa Coffey. 
Um, I don't know if she's been briefed on this yet and what she's going to do about it, but we have to become self-sufficient. We turn away thousands of people from medical school each year. It's, it's very competitive. I'll just say a bit about technology because um, I had um, the organisation that, that I ran was assessed as being the most digitally advanced hospital in the country for a while. And some trusts are very digitally advanced, but some have got little more than electric typewriters. And they say they're digital because they write their notes on an iPad with a, with a pen. And actually, it's just paper being used, ele electronics uses paper. And it's a bit like boards are very scared of technology because so much of it has failed in the past. Now, imagine you're trying to tell a non-driver to buy a car, and they don't drive, they've not been in a car, they don't know what to do with it, so they think, well, I'm, I'll buy the best quality I can, then I can't go wrong. So you get somebody who goes and buys a Rolls Royce, but then finds you can't get it in the parking space or anything else because they, they don't know how to assess what they need to do. And that's what's happened in the IT systems. I know people who have said, I'm going to buy the most expensive IT system for the hospital that I can. Can't go wrong. Oh, you can go wrong. So Cambridge, they imported one from America called Epic, which is designed to be um, a costing system, a bill system. Chief exec lost his job because they lost 250,000 patients and the whole thing was, you know, this is what I think the NHS Digital should do is actually give guidance for board on which systems are fit for purpose in this country and which ones you should buy. So already you can see that technology frees up clinician time, reduces errors, improves patient safety and can take over the, what we used to call the grunt tasks from, from clinical staff. There's a lot of routine, mundane, boring stuff in healthcare that we ask highly qualified people to do and highly qualified people when asked to do boring, routine, mundane stuff are not good at it. Computers are very good at that. AI can do stuff. Some, um, art, some AI programs are now as good or better at reading some radiology um, scans and x-rays than, than humans. And they're going to get better. We've not yet learned to import data from wearables into the NHS. We need to. We should be able to. Now, this big thing about you should see your GP face-to-face. -face, I don't want to see my GP face-to-face. -face. I'd rather just go into my study, log on, have a conversation and be done. I don't want to travel and go and see somebody. If I need to go in and get blood done or something, that's different. But just that consultation where they don't actually touch you, you don't need to do that. Remote consultations um, should be a thing of the future. And if we also start to think about climate change, something like over a third of the emissions associated with primary care from patients travelling to and from um, to get their appointments. And the other thing that would help with the um, workforce issue is actually if people are doing stuff online, why can't they talk to a doctor in the Far East or Australia? Why can't we do things in that way? Because you don't need to actually say, I need to get my symptoms. Somebody come back and say, yeah, here's your prescription. So NHS Digital could help on this one. So we've said this before, there's an awful lot that's got to go into the NHS. So this is my prescription for what should happen. We've got to get everything right. How can you talk to somebody about their health when they've not got anywhere to live? How can you talk to somebody about get more exercise when they have no access to green spaces? How can you talk to somebody about, you know, well, actually, you know, pre-prepared meals with lots of um, preservatives in are really bad for you if they can't actually afford to eat anything but... The anxiety and everything else called by crime and the climate, it, you know, it's really, really important that all these policies line up. And then the one that's often talked about for healthcare is social services because patients, elderly, they need to get out from hospital, they need to have support in their home. Social services were severely cut by um, the years of austerity. So the one I know best, where I live, Birmingham, 40% cut in, local, in, in central government funding. It's bound to flow down, plus the fact they have big workforce issues as well. There were some nursing homes in Birmingham and the West Midlands where 70% of the staff came from Europe, and they went. Hotels and other organisations that are used to taking people from Europe as well um, could up their pay rates to attract people out of there. So we lost a whole swathe of people. So there's not enough people there. So at the time I wrote this, Barclay was the new Secretary of State. He isn't anymore. He really focused on ambulance handovers. Now, if you want to sort out ambulance handovers, what do you think you might do? Now, we had telephone hackathons where people had to phone up and talk about how they could do it. Now, if it was as simple as doing a phone call, it would have been done. 
He's also said to cut the use of management consultants and to have a recruitment freeze on central organisations. I don't disagree with that last one because actually central organisations have sucked a lot of people out the front line and we need everybody we can get back there. But it's small things that aren't going to make a big difference. But then he said something really interesting. The NHS needs to scrap a whole pile of targets and admit it can't do everything well. Well, it used to do everything well, and it used to do everything really, really well, and it used to do everything really, really well at pretty low cost. So that's a very, very significant and, I think, serious admission. So they're talking about creating new elective hubs, places where people can go in elective surgery. Great. They're going to have new kits in them, but where are they going to get the staff to run them from? So I followed the Conservative leadership campaign, so you didn't have to. The Conservative leadership campaign did not really throw a lot of light on this. They had a hard line on underperforming, and there was a lot of suspicion about private intent. Now, Penny Mordaunt said, the top 180 innovations we've had, how many are used in the NHS? Nobody could understand what she meant by that, and it turns out people think this is what might have been. There's an organisation called 180 Innovations, and they said, we're not used in the NHS. And that's how it might have got changed, but nobody can work that one out. Because if you think about 180 innovations, one of them has got to be the motor engine and stuff. Well, actually, we do use them in the NHS. Rishi Sunak said, the NHS may be a national religion, but it's also a national disgrace. Rishi Sunak's right to get tough on targets. It is not a national disgrace. Tom Tugan had said, focus on leadership and bring in the army. Everybody, you know that old saying about if, if your only tool's a spanner, then the problems are, every problem's a nut. So many people have said bring in the army. Now, one of my other jobs was to go and talk to the army about leadership on their leadership courses because they thought the NHS did it. You know, it, it all goes round. The army have not got the skills required to run the NHS. Kim, Kemi Badenoch said she couldn't get a dental appointment. Way. Liz Truss said, divert the raise that the NHS is getting from national insurance into social care. Now, that is probably um, not a bad call if it means social care is fixed. I don't think it will. Sort out the pension issue. I will be fair to her, on this occasion only. That is probably the first person who's addressed that as an issue, and it does need to be addressed. Whether it's fair or not, it's a reality, and it needs to be sorted now. And she said, I have fewer layers of management. Now, let's just visit that one just for a minute. The NHS is one of the most complex organisations in the world. It has about 2% of its staff as managers. The average across the UK industry is around 9% of staff are managers, so I think it's pretty lean anyway. I am not saying that all management in the NHS is good. It isn't, and I've spent a lot of my career going around and sorting out failed trusts, but the problem is not too much management. Often it's too little. A King's Fund report came out in 2022, said exactly that, and it, it also did a, a thing, mis busting the myths that were going around the press at the moment around lazy GPs. GPs are running around about 15% vacancies. There was a target from both the last two Tory um, election campaigns saying we'd increase it and they haven't done that. It's continued to fall. And yet they're still seeing the amount of consultations they're doing is massive. So I think the current problems are reflected the years of underinvestment, the lack of workforce planning and organisational tinkering that's gone on by politicians. So when the things have gone wrong, nobody says, actually, I wish I hadn't done that reorganisation. That was clearly wrong. They just attacked the NHS itself. The NHS is one of the best systems in the world when properly funded. But it's got to have the inv right investment. It's got to have funding and long-term planning. It needs to have sort of period of stability. And they've got to sort out the rest of it. It's really easy to be a chief executive. You can do these four things. You've got the right numbers of staff with the right skills. You've got the right equipment in the right buildings. And you've got the right infrastructure. And by that, I mean social services and everything else around. Then it flows right. It's always easy to fail and very quick. So if a, if a high-performing trust is going to fail, it'll fail within a year or two, three years. It takes 10 years to build it back up. The same with the NHS. We're not going to get this better unless we start training more staff today and we start investing in buildings and we start investing in kit. We've got to have all of that now. Decline is always much quicker and it's mostly about the workforce. We've got to train them get the right numbers in, and we've got to pay them properly and look after them well, not just attack them. I mean, it was all great at the start, wasn't it? We all clapped for them. I like the suggestion that we should all go out and clap the energy companies and not pay them anymore, but anyway. The estates, we really paid a price in the estates for not having a modern estate for COVID um, because we couldn't cope. And I personally would like to see 
politically a consensus among the parties, particularly around long-term targets for the NHS and the workforce, that actually we agree a level of funding, we set targets and let the NHS do the rest. And if it's a cross-party consensus that they all sign up to, no matter who's in power, particularly or at the very least on workforce planning and doc, it's not going to be subject to each treasury review. So the only structures that work for patients are GPs, hospitals and community. The rest is all filler around the outside of it and I don't think reorganising has any issue. It doesn't matter who reports to who. As long as the funding flows and it goes to the front line of patient care, it'll work. But we've got to have a long-term plan, particularly around the workforce. Reorganisations don't work. Short term, sort out the pensions, train more staff, reduce some training requirements. Some of the training requirements for staff are particularly um, irrelevant. There's about, at last count, three, four hundred um, structures and bodies that are funded by the NHS that do not contribute to the front line. I might need to recount them again soon. I'd review them all and see if we could get those staff back to the front line. The inspection and regulation regime is a hugely onerous, bureaucratic, time-consuming um, system, and I think it needs to be much slicker and, and much shorter. Don't know if I've said this. It's got to be have a long-term plan. But then coming on to bits, I think... We talk about making this country a life sciences leader, yet we've cut funding in R&D and life sciences. Um, and we need to really heavily invest in that and have a proper plan. When austerity started, I used to be on the um, Office of the Strategic Coordination of Health Research, which oversaw where, what went to the MRC and everything else, and IHR. And they tended to concentrate on the Golden Triangle, Oxford, Cambridge, and London, because they felt that they'd deliver, when they had a small amount of funding, they were more likely to deliver. And actually, we need to invest in the whole nation we need to invest in the Midlands, I would say that, wouldn't I? But we also need to invest up north and actually make the whole country much more involved around life sciences and technology. And something we've lost a bit of is global cooperation in major research initiatives. We've lost some of that in Europe and we need to get that back. Research now is all about mass data sets, big, big numbers of patients, big, big numbers of trials, and we can only do that by cooperation. And I think we've walled ourselves off from the world quite a bit since Brexit, and we need to get that back. Am I optimistic? I'm, I'm, an, I'm an optimist by nature. Somebody once said that the NHS is the biggest train set in Whitehall, and secretaries of state can't stop fiddling with it and tinkering with it. It will always be politically led because it's taxpayer funded, but I'd much rather have that than have the American model. The NHS is rightly regarded, but actually public support's waning because there's been a, um, the press campaign against it, really. But we need to just properly resource it and get it back to its premier position because the alternatives just don't bear thinking about, particularly not as I get older anyway. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. This is a very nice, interesting talk. I think we are running out of time, but we may have one quick question. I cannot see hands. Yes, 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 please. Is, is nice to have. 
But if that line, that the like how our outcomes line, isn't our how well did we do across the board line, then we probably need better. I think we've got to go on what they've decided to measure, and there's a lot of detail behind all of that, so if, I would urge you to read the Commonwealth reports, and there's a, an awful lot goes on across. So if you look at, um, there's a lot of figures around at the moment, but there's so much I can put in, and I'm so interested in all of this, I could have made you sit here all day, um, which would have been very unkind of me. But actually, in terms of equality of society, and the whole thing about air pollution is really important. But some countries are doing some things exceptionally well that do bear comparison. So India's chil children's heart surgery program is brilliant. It's absolutely one of the best outcomes in the world for, for children's heart surgery. There's a whole pile of places that do things better. But what the Commonwealth Fund does is take all of that and try and weight it and put it together as a whole. And that last one about health outcomes does consider such a lot about the whole society. But there is a lot of detail behind that in their report, so just I could only pull up the graph on that because otherwise we could have been here an awful long time. But I think we are getting worse in those outcomes. So the, for the first time ever in this country, um, a coroner put a death of a child in London down to air pollution. That's the first time that's happened as our airs get... Um, as emissions have grown and so much other things has gone wrong. I wouldn't even want to go near what would happen to anyone who swims in the sea right now. But, you know, there's, there's such a lot goes on that really impacts on health. And actually, I could have done a whole thing about this is what causes health. The health service is there to fix it when it goes wrong. But that was just to examining the healthcare system. Well, we could have a, probably have a big debate, but we can't. Yeah. Let's take her one more time. Thank you very much. Again. Thank you. Thank you.